Section A. Parentheses. Parentheses are kind of like a dash, in that whatever you put inside the parentheses can be in whatever grammatical form you want. The stuff inside the parentheses is called a parenthetical expression. Your parenthetical expression could be a verb phrase, a gerund, a complete sentence, or a couple of complete sentences. All are welcome into the loving arms of the parentheses. Take a look at this. Peanut butter. For more information on peanut butter, be sure to check out Bloomington's Peanut Butter and You. Is a yummy treat. Here, we've taken a sentence, peanut butter is a yummy treat, and injected a piece of information that is sort of related to the main point, but not really. It doesn't tell you anything about peanut butter or how delicious it is, but it tells you where you can go for more information. The perfect occasion for a couple of parentheses. When you're using parentheses, you'll probably have to deal with all the other punctuation that's already happening in the sentence. But don't worry, as we said earlier, there are a few guidelines we can use to decide exactly what goes where. The first rule is never to put a comma immediately before an opening parentheses. Take a look at this. Let's take a look at this sentence without the parenthetical expression. Before I went to the dentist, I stopped by the mall and bought a lovely new parka. Hmm, looks like we have a subordinate clause. Before I went to the dentist, because we know it can't stand alone as a complete sentence. That's why it's linked through the independent clause, I stopped by the mall and bought a lovely new parka. We know we need a comma between dentist and I to separate the dependent clause from the independent clause. Now we have to figure out where to put our parenthetical expression, before or after the comma. Well, we just learned that we can't put a comma right before the opening parentheses. Hey, that means the comma has to go here after the closing parentheses. There we go. We used to have a bunch of houseplants, a philodendron, a fern, and a couple begonias. But now she detests plants fiercely. Personally, I think it's a little weird to hate something like a houseplant so passionately. Her mother, what was her name again, is trying to find Felicity some help. Normally, you wouldn't have this many sentences with parentheses in the same paragraph. If all of that parenthetical stuff has to be included, you should change the direction of your paragraph to make it fit. We just thought you should know. Now, back to our sentences. In each of these sentences, the contents of the parentheses have their own punctuation things going on. In the first one, we have some commas that are separating items in a list. The second one is a complete sentence that ends in a period, so we put parentheses around the whole thing, period and all. In the third example, we've inserted a question inside another sentence. And what's a question without a question mark? Also notice that sometimes we begin complete sentences in parentheses with a capital letter, and sometimes we don't. If the sentence is being inserted into another sentence, like, what was her name again? We don't capitalize the first letter. But if we're using parentheses around a sentence that's standing on its own, we do use a capital letter. Like when we wrote, personally, I think it's a little weird to hate something like a houseplant so passionately. See? You can use the same guidelines to decide where you put your period. If the sentence is being inserted into another sentence, the period goes outside the parentheses. But if we're using parentheses around a sentence that's standing on its own, the period goes inside the parentheses. If we write, I hear that huckleberry pie. I wish I weren't allergic to huckleberries. Is superb. Our parenthetical expression, I wish I weren't allergic to huckleberries, does not have a period, even though it is a complete sentence, because it's not standing alone. It's stuck in the middle of the sentence. I hear that huckleberry pie is superb. Mm -mm -mm. But if we write, I hear that huckleberry pie is superb, I wish I weren't allergic to huckleberries. We put the period inside the parentheses. That's because I wish I weren't allergic to huckleberries is a complete sentence that's standing alone. These parentheses are great, Bob, but tell us what they're for. Oh, well, Susie, parentheses are a great thing to have around the house, just in case you want to insert some material in a sentence that's interesting but not essential to that sentence. And your parenthetical expression can be in whatever form you want. Don't forget, Bob, they make great earrings. And as always, buy one, get one free. Hurry, as you can see, supplies are dwindling fast. And if you don't buy them now, your head's going to blow right off your shoulders. Section B. 
quotation marks. The second kind of punctuation mark that comes in pairs are quotation marks, or these little guys. They look like two pairs of shapes that point in at each other, and just like the parentheses, you have an opening quotation mark and a closing quotation mark. Quotation marks have four main purposes. First, we use quotation marks to frame a direct quotation, which can be either from speech or written text. Second, they're used when writing the title of some created works, such as poems, short stories, or magazine articles. Third, they're used around words or phrases that are being defined. And lastly, they can frame a part of a sentence that the writer is using sarcastically. Let's take a look at each of these uses one at a time. Then we'll show you how to use them with other forms of punctuation. The first way we use quotation marks is probably the most common, and that's to frame a direct quotation, which is word for word what someone else has said or written. And so I said, Missy, I think Stan's really into you. And she was all like, whatever, Jennifer, no way would I date him. Here Jennifer is relating to a friend, a conversation she had with Missy. Notice how she's used quotation marks to surround the direct quotations from the conversation. Missy, I think Stan's really into you. And whatever, Jennifer, no way would I date him. The quotation marks show that these quotes are word for word, which is important because Jennifer would never gossip. There's another way to say something someone else said, and that's paraphrasing. Suppose you change what someone else has said into your own words. We know it's not a direct quotation because it's no longer word for word what they said. When you paraphrase, you do not use quotation marks. Again, you don't use quotation marks when paraphrasing. And then Missy started complaining that she didn't have a top to match her purple and orange pants. I mean, what does she expect? They're purple and orange. This time, she paraphrased what Missy said. Instead of telling us word for word, she used her own words to explain Missy's fashion emergency, namely, that nothing matches her purple and orange pants. So since this time she paraphrased, instead of using a direct quotation, she did not use quotation marks. The second use of quotation marks we mentioned was with titles of songs, poems, magazine articles, and short stories, like Tiptoe Through the Tulips, The Raven, what you can do to prevent hair loss, and the telltale heart. The third use of quotation marks is to surround a word or phrase that's being defined, or specifically referred to in a sentence as a word. Here are a couple of examples. The word marmoset refers to a small South American monkey with a long fuzzy tail and a cute little face. What a sweetie. How cute. Aww. This particular marmoset has been trained to lip-sync Billie Holiday every time it hears the word pumpkin. Would you look at that? In the first sentence, we use quotation marks around marmoset because we're defining what it is. Then in the second sentence, we've used them around the word pumpkin because we're referring to it as the word pumpkin, not a large orangish autumnal gourd. The fourth and final way to use quotation marks is to indicate sarcasm or irony. Yeah, right. I'm really going to go out with a winner like Oswald? What? You broke up with me, Lucy? See how we used quotation marks to surround the word winner. Jennifer was being sarcastic, you see, so we use them to make sure the sarcasm is clear to the reader. Using quotation marks to use a word sarcastically isn't something you want to do in formal writing, but it's fine for informal letters and stuff like that. So far, in all the examples we've looked at, we've dealt with quotation marks in their regular form, which looks like this. But sometimes, you may need to put a set of quotation marks within another set, and if that's the case, we use single quotation marks, like this. Here's what it would look like. Aunt Bernice just went on and on after the concert, repeating, I just love that song, Ice Ice Baby. Here we have one quoted item within another quoted item, since both what Aunt Bernice said and the title of the song need to be in quotation marks. Since the title of the song appears within the other quotation, we've used single quotation marks for it instead of double. 
I can't believe how cute these quotation marks are. I'm telling you, Susie, my wife uses quotation marks all the time. There's nothing quite like a quotation mark to frame a quote, a title, a defined word, or something sarcastic. Nice shirt. <laughs> Coffee. <laughs> now we're going to talk about the rules governing quotation marks and other forms of punctuation. Punctuating with quotation marks is an art, not a science. That means sources vary on the exact details. And that means that different teachers are going to have different opinions as to what are exceptions to rules and what aren't. So, use the following guidelines to help you. But, check with your teacher if something just doesn't look right to you. So, batten down the hatches. Here we go. Rule number one, never put another form of punctuation after an opening quotation mark. This is one rule you can always count on. When an opening quotation mark and some other punctuation mark are right next to each other, the other punctuation mark always goes before the quotation mark. Here are a couple sentences that show this rule. Toby said to Lindy, Will you go out with me? Lindy had only one thing to say. No way. No and way are the only two words Lindy knows how to say. Isn't that tragic? In each of these sentences, we have punctuation marks that come before things that are quoted. A comma, a colon, and a parenthesis. In each case, we've placed the mark before the opening quotation mark. We've used three examples, but the same holds true for all forms of punctuation. One down, four to go. Rule number two. Commas come before direct quotations. Polly remarked, There is a big difference between frogs and toads. Toad legs, she said, are tough and chewy. Sydney replied, I quite agree, and continued to eat. Notice how we've put the quotation marks around the parts of the sentence that are Polly's and Sydney's direct words. Then we put commas before and after the quotations, whether they came at the beginning of the sentence, in the middle, or at the end. Let's take another look at that first sentence. Polly remarked there's a big difference between frogs and toads. Remember that rule number one told us never to put another punctuation mark right after the opening quotation mark. That's why we wrote, Polly remarked, comma, quotation mark, there's a big difference between frogs and toads. Not, Polly remarked, quotation mark, comma, there's a big difference between frogs and toads. That wasn't so bad. Now let's talk about punctuation with the closing quotation mark. We're going to go over the general rules that tell you what goes inside and what goes outside. The forms of punctuation you're probably going to use with quotation marks the most are our good friends, the period and the comma. So here we go. Rule number three, commas and periods go inside the closing quotation mark. Let's look at an example. Don't eat me, said the little gingerbread man. I'm made with hydrogenated animal solids and refined sugar. In the first sentence, we begin with a gingerbread man quote, which we know needs a comma to separate it from the rest of the sentence. And the entire second sentence is a quotation itself, so it ends with a period. So, using our new rule, we know that both the period and the comma go inside the quotation marks. While commas and periods always come before the closing quotation mark, colons, semicolons, and dashes always come after it. Here's the rule. Rule number four. Colons, semicolons, and dashes are always placed outside the quoted material. Like this. This. Hungry Spice unfolded her napkin and said, Oh, I do plan to eat you. She wasn't at all dissuaded. Then she sang the first line of her new song, Gingerbread Jive. Sweeter than sugar, binded with lard, when I fell for you, Boy, I fell hard. So the gingerbread man said, Hmm, I could listen to your new song or die a slow, painful death while you eat me. My choice is clear. He let her eat him. 
In the first sentence, we have a semicolon coming after quoted material, in the second a colon, and in the third a dash. In each of these three cases, we've placed the marks outside the quoted material. Whenever you use a semicolon, colon, or dash with quoted material, they always come after the closing quotation mark. So far, we've talked about the insiders, the period, and the comma, and the outsiders, semicolon, colon, and dash. Now let's look at the marks with a fear of commitment, the question mark and the exclamation point. Now these two marks can be a bit trickier than the others because there are times when they come before the closing quotation mark and times when they come after it. Rule number five, question marks and exclamation points can either go inside the quotation marks or outside. To decide, look at the quoted material separate from the rest of the sentence. If the quoted material needs the question mark or exclamation point, it goes inside the quotation marks. But if it's the sentence that needs the question mark or exclamation point, it goes outside the quotation marks. Boys and girls, can you believe the gingerbread man would rather be eaten than listen to the song Gingerbread Jive? Okay, prepare to be eaten, cried Hungry Spice. Just then, as our poor hero was about to be consumed, his pager went off. Who could be paging me? Asked the gingerbread man. It was Stan, the gingerbread man's agent, telling him that a bunch of British chicks wanted to buy the rights to his new song, Will You Be My Cookie? I'm rich! This passage shows both question marks and exclamation points coming before and after the closing quotation marks. Let's do a play-by-play -play and see why we put everything where we did. In our first sentence, we have a song title, so naturally we've used quotation marks to surround it. But notice that the entire sentence is a question, so we also use a question mark. Now we have to ask ourselves, is this question mark a part of the song's title, or does the title just happen to be in a question? Let's remove the title Gingerbread Jive from the sentence and look at it by itself to see if the question mark belongs to it. Hmm, Gingerbread Jive. That makes the title of the song a question, and it doesn't look like that's what we want. Now if we look at the sentence, we see that it does look like it's in a question form. That means the question mark belongs to the sentence, not the quoted stuff. That's why we want to put the question mark outside the quotation mark. In the second sentence, we have, OK, prepare to be eaten, cried Hungry Spice. We've used quotation marks to frame Hungry Spice's quote, OK, prepare to be eaten. Let's pop it out of the sentence and see what we have. It looks like the exclamation point is an actual part of Hungry's quote. Since it's tied to the quote, it goes inside the quotation marks. Now we're getting somewhere. All right, later we have the sentence, who could be paging me, asked the gingerbread man. Here we have the same situation we just had, only we're dealing with a question mark instead of an exclamation point. Notice that if we pull the quotation out of the sentence, we can see that the question mark belongs to it. In other words, the quotation is a question, while the sentence is not. That means we have to put the question mark inside the quotation marks. Okay, one more. A couple sentences later, we have a real doozy. It was Stan, the gingerbread man's agent, telling him that a bunch of British chicks wanted to buy the rights to his new song, Will You Be My Cookie? Let's break this bad boy down and see what's going on. Basically, we have an exclamatory sentence with quoted material inserted in it that's in the form of a question. We know that the question mark belongs to the title, Will You Be My Cookie? That's why the question mark belongs inside the quotation marks. The exclamation point, on the other hand, is part of the big picture, not the quoted stuff. So it goes outside the quotation marks, so the question mark is the end mark for the quote, while the exclamation point belongs to the sentence. And that's how you use other forms of punctuation with quotation marks. At the beginning of quoted material, all forms of punctuation come before the first quotation mark, which puts them outside the quoted passage. After the quote, periods and commas go inside the quotation marks, semicolons, colons, and dashes go outside the quotation marks, and question marks and exclamation points sometimes go inside and sometimes go outside. When you're dealing with a question mark or an exclamation point, look at the quoted material separate from the rest of the sentence to decide which one the mark is more closely tied to. If it belongs to the quote, it goes inside. But if it's more of a part of the big picture, put it outside the quotation marks. Now that we've gone over parentheses and quotation marks, we only have one more form of punctuation that comes in pairs, the brackets. 
and compared to the others, brackets are a piece of cake. 